So, student sense of belonging, is there evidence that supports that all students feel a sense of belonging in the classroom community? Um, does the teacher accept and promote the student's acceptance of students' background, interests, and opinions? And I really think promoting the acceptance of students is probably the new, the new piece that um, you know, we're trying to, to encourage at this juncture. But really the first rule of thumb that we need to think of is for you to remember that we're talking about very thin slices of behavior. When we're, when we're looking at eye observation and Dr. Maranzano's work, each element is a very thin slice of behavior. And I say that I, I want you to think in terms of the teacher behaviors as opposed to teacher's thoughts or feelings, if necessary. Because I know that all of us sitting here, because we're human, we sometimes feel very justified in a thought or a feeling about a student. Well, they don't care. They don't do their homework. They don't do this. So we have all of these behavioral pieces that we put into our mind as facts that justifies our opinion toward a student. So uh, let's see if I put this diagram in here. For those of you who have been through the uh, seven habits, remember that see, do, get model? You know, it's like what you see, you know, affects what you do, affects what you get. I thought of that whenever I was talking about the thin slices behavior, the thin slices of behavior, and in this particular one where um, we're talking about what you do instead of what you feel. Because sometimes, unless you're going into the mode of, I'm going to consciously have a paradigm shift about this student, then you just have to disregard that. And as we move into dealing with low expectancy students in uh, design question nine, I think that's where we tend to struggle, you know, as humans, as grown-ups dealing with kids, is that um, you, because we're human, we can't get away from the fact that we have certain thoughts and feelings. So how do we be conscious of that and behave differently? So it's about a behavior piece at this particular juncture, more so than uh, trying to get you to change your whole thought or paradigm about students in general. So building a sense of community um, is by demonstrating your, and I hate, I'm a secondary person, so for me to say this sentence is really hard. By demonstrating your loving acceptance of all children's backgrounds, it's just not part of my language. But, <laughs> but anyway, this is what Dr. Marzato and all of the experts say. Demonstrating your loving acceptance of all children's backgrounds, experience, experiences, and viewpoints, you create an environment that says everyone is welcome here in this classroom. But more importantly, this is our modeling word again, we're modeling how we want the teacher or the students to treat each other. And I think that's the important piece in um, developing a sense of community that we're, you know, the goal is to celebrate those differences. So what are we referring to when we talk to about how can we build a sense of community? In my mind, I think of how can we build that sense of belonging? How can I, as an individual, come into this classroom and feel a somewhat a sense of belonging? Different ways you can do that. You can build that through identity, where students have pictures of themselves. Scott just sent me Betsy, and I want to use you as an example if you don't mind. Her learning goals, or her scales, is actually pictures of her students. Can you describe it, Betsy, real quick? This is a great way to build a sense of identity within the classroom. Um, because my students probably wouldn't understand if I explain what each um, you know, tier in the scale meant. I took pictures of them, you know, the very first one that we're going, you know, I don't know. It, um, and then um, it shows up to the point where they know it so well that they're teaching it, so I show the student pointing and teaching. And, um, you know, when they've got it, they're working, they're doing it by themselves um, so they can see that's what it's supposed to look like. But. Yeah, in, in her resource classroom, you know, kindergarten, first and second grade, you know, the whole idea was to start getting them to understand the learning goal and scales 
So at the very lowest level, it's just a cute little picture of one of her students, you know, doing this. <laughs> I don't know. And then the next level was, um, what? It's um, one of my aides and the student, but the aide has the pencil. Yeah. And so it's a, is a picture of the aide and the student working together, mm -hmm. and you know, on up to where there's a picture of two students, one student's teaching the other student. And for her level, it was just, it was a great way to, you know, demonstrate. But the, the scales piece, but by the same token, it's building that identity within that classroom. And that's somewhat of a secondary model because your students come in and out. It's not necessarily, you know, they're not, she's not the general ed classroom teacher. She's the resource classroom teacher. So those kinds of examples of building identity, uh, making your classroom familiar. Uh, one of the examples that I read is using, you know, other than things that are traditional, are students, when they first walk into your classroom, do they see things that are familiar, that look like maybe last year's classroom, it's, if it's the first year? Are there materials in there that look familiar, or is it just a completely brand new environment? So that's what that means by familiarity. familiarity. Building trust. I wanted to spend a second on building trust because it's one of those words that we just use and we understand it and we know what it is as adults and how that affects our relationships. But with students, whether you're in kindergarten or you're in 12th grade, the word trust means something different. In some of the workshops many of us have been in, we've done an activity where I will say the word trust and you write down what word associates in your mind with that, nobody ever gets the same definition, essentially. You guys remember that, those of you who have been with me in that particular workshop? It's like, that word means something different. So to build community or for a student to build you know, their sense of belonging in that classroom, you have to consciously design how you're gonna build that trust. So it's developed through your calm acceptance of children's feelings. And what Dr. Marzano suggests is using a lot of parallel play and work before you're expecting people to become friends. And um, if you think about, like Scott, for example, is going through the uh, Leadership Academy in Madison County right now. And one of the first activities that they do is uh, they spend a couple of days on team building activities and you go out and you do these little trustings. That's parallel play, you know, it's, you know, but now after he's been in that group environment, maybe three, four times now, I'm sure he would tell you that there's beginning to be a building of actual friendships and relationships within that particular group. For those of you who were in different Seven Habits classes, those people that were actually in your class with you, some of you it's been ages ago, but that is really deep personal content that we talk about in that course. And you're learning and you are experiencing a deep personal connection in a parallel way. Does that make sense? So there's so what we tend to do when we have problems is we're expecting kids to become friends and get along and collaborate and do all of these kinds of things that we want them to do in the classroom prior to consciously designing activities that helps them to uh, build trusting relationships. And they're either going to come or they're not going to come. You can't force people to like each other and, and you can't force people to um, you know, play with each other. Um, You've got to you know, arrange things to allow them to learn to want to do that on their own. Um, another thing that helps students have a sense of belonging in a classroom is predictability. You know, are your rules and procedures <coughs> consistent? Do you establish them and keep them consistent repeatedly? Family involvement. Um, you know, realizing, as we all know, every child that comes through your doors comes with a family of some sort. Um, you know, respecting that, finding ways to uh, bring the family in, whether it's through discussion or um, physically bringing them in to be a part of your, your school day. So, to the point, what do I typically do to understand students' interests and backgrounds? And this is, very, this is specifically right from Dr. Marzano. Um, and I'm going to go into a little more depth on some of these, but all of these things are things that you probably already did. 
student background surveys. You know, I think I included Dr. Marzano's at what he has in one of his textbooks in your packet. Um, it's just a student survey, first day of school, getting to know your students. I'm sure all of you do something like that. Opinion questionnaires, what do you think of this, that, or the other? You're just trying to learn about the students. And a lot of the content that I saw in Dr. Marzano's work was about strategies for you to get to know the students. I don't feel like in Alexandria we had an issue of our teachers making efforts to get to know their students. So I'm going to blaze through some of these pretty quickly. Um, individual teacher-student conferences. Some of the recommendations there are making it meaningful for the student. That the student would say that you and your parents have a good relationship. You know, that would be a piece of evidence that uh, we would be looking at. Well, for the parent-teacher conferences, I'm sorry. School newspapers, talking with students and maybe having classroom time where you are actually talking about students um, that have been in the newspaper, in the school newspaper, or school publication, and what are the students doing. Um, informal class interviews, investigating student culture, um, autobiographical metaphors and analogies. I feel like you guys already know what this is. so. Are, not if I need to go, keep going, let's see, are we good, <laughs> are we good? Uh, six word autobiographies, can someone tell me what that is, explain what a six word autobiography would be? Describe yourself in six words, you know, it could be, um, you know, a, a girl that might like dance, might have a picture, you know, of the word dance, you know, you can create a bag of goodies and just a few key words that represent yourself. And again, it's not just about you learning about yourself, creating opportunities for all of the other students to learn about them too. Um, one of the things that, that I would do if I were back in the classroom is I would use quotes because that's what I enjoy myself personally. And asking what does this particular, you know, have the students pick out a quote for themselves and then explain why does this touch you? Or, you know, it could be one where it's like people do such and such because people who were doing such and such are my pet peeve and they've annoyed me yesterday. Or, you know, giving students an opportunity to share their opinion with evidence backing up why they have that opinion too. That goes a long way in building that culture. Um, lineups, I think of Facebook, you know, if you line up over here if you like such and such, line up over here if you don't like it. So you can use lineups as ways to um, get students to understand each other's backgrounds as well. And individual student learning goals. Um, you can have a, I think of uh, self-advocacy goals uh, with this some to some degree in that if you have a, your, your content goal and a student has a particular interest or has some way that you can connect an individual learning goal to your content goal. You know, it, in some places it would apply, in some places not. But if you could find an individual learning goal that could be easily attached to your content goal and then having them <coughs> you know, work toward, um, you know, well, how are you doing? And then you go through the whole scale process with that particular individual learning goal as well. Okay, here are some more specifics in terms of um, what you would, what you, we would look for in actual pieces of evidence. What's the desired student responses in using some of these strategies? Student background surveys. Um, you would be looking for students that you have developed in them the ability to respond honestly and in detail. Um, the student would describe you as someone who is interested in them. You know, kids' perceptions are pretty harsh when they come to us as educators. So that is a tough thing to do. Opinion questionnaires, um, just a brief exploration up there again. 
create discussions with top students to share their perspectives on common topics. Um, I think of Socratic seminars, uh, discuss with students' opinions about classroom topics, incorporate student opinions in class activities. Um, and I think the important piece here, and this is, a, this is one of the big changes in the Common Core Standards, is that students can explain the, their reasoning for their opinion. You know, it's, we should be encouraging students to share their opinions. As long as we encourage them to back it up with some evidence. Why do you feel that way? You know, it's okay, you're not right or wrong, it's your opinion. Why do you feel that way? Individual teacher-student conferences. Um, this is where a teacher schedules individual uh, conferences with their students. I know the, uh, those teachers who have gone through the Indiana Writing Project, you do that on a very regular basis, and that's a core part of your curriculum. Uh, the desired student response is, again, that they, the students respond honestly and in detail when they're in the conference with you, and um, the student will describe the teacher as someone who's genuinely interested in them. You know, kids know who's interested in them and who's, who's not. Parent-teacher conferences, um, summarizing what's already known about a student prior to meeting with his or her parents. Um, you, you know, remember with the whole collaborative piece of our evaluation, you, you, you want to develop a collaboration between the parent, the teacher, and the student. So including some summary with the student uh, prior to meeting with the parents is a good way to, you know, open up that conversation. Again, I'm preaching to the choir on some of this, I know, and I, and I don't mean to be condescending. Uh, the desired student response, tell the teacher about important events in their lives. So, you know how some students are just going to clam up, they don't, they just don't want to engage. You know, that might be one of your low expectancy students. Uh, that's where the real work has to come into play. Um, because the desired student response is to, to get that student to be open with you. Describes the, te the student would describe the teacher-parent relationship as good. Of course, using your school newspaper, newsletter, or bulletins. Um, you know, do you have a place in your classroom where you note student achievements, upcoming events? You know, that would be a way to help build that community. And again, you got to balance that with: Are the athletes, are those people who are always at the, you know, in in the, you know, varsity athletics, are those the only ones who are going to get the um, time and attention in the classroom? <coughs> <coughs> Investigating student culture. Um, this becomes more and more apparent to me as the older I get and the less and less cool I am to my daughter, of which I'm not cool at all. Um, you know, I used to think that I, you know, really got it with the kids. And, you know, it's kind of like each three months I realize I'm, I'm older and you know, nursing home bail, literally, because I am so, so honestly out of touch with the student culture. So this doesn't mean necessarily only, you know, Hispanic, you know, it's, it's not talking about racial culture, it's talking about our culture versus student culture as well. So I would fail miserably at this, um, at this particular juncture without really making an effort to dive into what the student lingo is. I try. I have Twitter. Scott's one of my few. <laughs> All yeah. four of us. <laughs> and I use the Twitter thing just to spy on my daughter. <laughs> so that's a good thing. Um, but, you know, noticing popular terms and phrases that students use, you know, there are, you know, certainly derogatory ones that, you know, we all know about too. But there is, I'm sure, a lot of fun stuff that the kids use and lingo. You know, making an effort to get into that and knowing what that is and conversing with them. Um, the desired student response is that the, the students are okay with sharing information about their student culture with you. You know, they won't share anything with you. So, you know, that's a, tr that's a trick for adolescents. Okay, moving on, autobiographical metaphors and analogies. I'm sorry, Mackenzie, I forgot you were videotaping this, and you're going to put that on YouTube. <laughs> you know, I love you, honey. <laughs> Autobiographical metaphors and 
analogies. Um, we're asking students to compare their lives to the content being studied. And I think this is one that can, <coughs> you can really tap into with all of your content. Um, you know, because there's generally some sort of metaphor or analogy, whether it's humorous or serious, that we can find to, to relate to our content. And the desired student response is that they actually create metaphors and analogies that express their comparisons or relationships between the content and their lives. A little more on um, individual student learning goals. Uh, the teacher identifies students' personal interests that relate to the class's learning goal. I've already explained that, so I'll move on. Um, okay, so would your students say that you know them? Would the students say that you want to know, let's see, how did I word that? Wants to know how you are doing. Would you say that your students would say that you want to know how they are doing? That you want to know them better and that you accept them. And those, those are tough questions. You know, and of course, I was never in an elementary classroom. I think it would be, my perception in my mind is that it would be easier to have those close relationships than it would be, you know, for secondary students. I would say that I had my group of students that, um, you know, bonded to me, and you know, I coached track, so they, you know, my track students. But to say that the majority of them you know, would give me a positive response on that? I don't know. And the fact that I don't know and I can't answer that is, you know, if, if you're thinking that in your mind, that's, you can put a little more conscious effort into, into that. Okay, so this is what, and I'm sorry, it might be a little hard to read it. I'm okay, This is the actual scale. I'm sorry, these are the reflection questions. So if you are, if you're not using the strategy at all, then, you know, how can you begin to incorporate understanding students' <coughs> efforts? Okay, if any of you are not using it at all, then you probably have such a disinterest in working with kids that you wouldn't even be sitting there. So, you know, that would be not good. Um, the beginning level. How can you use your students' interest and background during interactions with students? And again, as we're looking at beginning and developing and applying, I think it's this difference is as you jump from beginning to developing, in addition to using students' interest and background during interactions with students, how can you monitor the extent to which a sense of community is formed in the classroom? So that's where you're moving up to a higher level of practice. And then applying, how might you adapt and create new strategies and techniques for using students' interest and backgrounds during interaction with students that address unique student needs and situations. You know, that student who's very different, who um, their interest and backgrounds are so far, you know, removed from what seems to be the norm of everyone else. You know, how do you really use those unique situations? So these are the questions that you would ask yourself as you're moving from one level of the scale to the next. And, you know, as you're looking at this scale, you can also think in your mind is how can I create those kinds of reflection questions for my students on my learning scales for my content? But that's a little different seminar. So we'll just move on. Then this is the scale. It, it's just because the thing just worked differently. This is the actual scale that the administrators will, will use when they're making a determination on where um, <coughs> your skill level is in the classroom. Not using the strategy was called for, but it wasn't exhibited. Beginning, use a strategy incorrectly or with parts missing. Uses, developing, uses students' interest and background during interactions with students. But the majority of the students are not monitored. You know, you're, you've got, it's obvious you've got to got that relationship with about you know, half your students or so. And then um, applying, you really develop that sense of so do you feel like when you walk into a classroom, you can tell what that sense of community is? Yeah. 
it's like sometimes you feel like you can, but if, but but I think by using this real language and, and putting language in actual pieces of evidence to um, what we're intentionally doing in the classroom or what the administrators might be looking for is, I think it brings to light the difference between I feel like everything's going great in the classroom. I feel I between it's just between feeling and knowing. You know, you kind of got that standard of what you're of what you're looking for. So while as an administrator, I would feel like I could walk into a classroom and I could I could get a feel for whether there is a good sense of community here. I like my observation because now I have some language to be able to engage in a conversation with with teachers or even with myself, I can articulate that in an intelligent way instead of just saying, oh, you know, it's a really great environment in your classroom and you know, everybody seems like they're having a good time. I like the way that we use use the language of, you know, a sense of community, a, you know, individual students having a sense of belonging and those students collectively creating a, a quality sense of community and culture in your classroom. <coughs> So we'll see if this video works. to the resource library and close this so I can show you how to get to it. And you want to see, it's like, I just want to learn something a little bit more than, you know, what does Dr. Marzano say about um, a particular topic? And you just want to watch a video. You don't, you don't want to read. So I made the category video, so I closed the filter. And I'm going to type into the search engine um, students, interest, and background. And we'll see what comes up. Okay, looks like there are several videos on understanding students' interest and background. 
And what you can do is see examples of teachers actually actually doing this well in the classroom. So I'm going to show one real quick. Let's pick the 11th grade. This video demonstrates a lesson segment and acted on the spot. One element of lesson segments and acted on the spot is understanding students' interests and background. And this can be done in a lot of different ways. Uh, as you watch this uh, secondary social studies teacher, uh, uh, notice what he does to build in uh, you know, student interests uh, to the content. This is a, an important distinction we need to make. You've got domestic grosses for movie ticket prices, right? Um, and this is the total amount that they made in ticket sales in the theater. Now here are a couple issues that might skew things. If it's a Disney movie, what do you guys remember about uh, Disney animated films? Yes. <laughs> Everyone loves them. And a large audience. Let's think a little bit differently about this. Look at the year. When did uh, Snow White come out? Was it 30? 37. 37, okay. 1937 for Snow White. What else? Uh, anybody in here see it in the theater? <laughs> what? And <laughs> <laughs> I walked right into that. Um, yeah, there we go. Let's dwell on it for a little while. How about uh, any of the other Disney movies on here? Do a quick scan. Anybody see Jungle Book in the theater? 101 Dalmatians in the theater? Okay. Guys, point, point of interest, some of the Disney movies, like Snow White, and uh, 101 Dalmatians, they didn't just have one showing in the box office, okay? So yes, Smarty Pants, I did see them in the theater because, because they showed them in the 1970s, late 1970s as well. And so, uh, you know, like 101 Dalmatians is one of the first uh, movies I remember seeing. I think largely because my grandparents uh, liked it and remembered seeing it when it open in the original uh, opening in the theater. So that counts in here too. So that can skew the data a little bit. All right. Now some of these uh, obviously debuted in your lifetime and some in uh, others' lifetimes, your grandparents, parents, and me, yes. And I'd like to think I'm not as old as your grandparents. Or let's flip that around. If your grandparents are 36, we might have some family issues to talk about. <laughs> so, here we go. Um, you can go ahead and speculate first, all right? And, and take a look at the list, see which ones you might want to target as a group once you know what the formula is. Right? I'm not going to tell you the formula just yet, but go ahead and talk. As you saw, the teacher spent a, you know, a bit of time asking students what movies they had seen, how many have seen this, how many have seen this. And that was a direct connection to the students' lives. You know, he was mentioning movies that uh, you know, a lot of them had seen you know, when they were here, but these high school kids and probably had seen when they were preteens and you know, uh, elementary school and elementary school kids. So just doing that, you know, uh, it communicates a message that you know their lives are that's a, that the topics important in their lives are you know topics that are worthy of uh, uh, being addressed in class. Um, the teacher actually uses uh, many other strategies. Too. Uh, you know, one is humor, uh, which uh, actually uh, deals with uh, uh, teacher-student relationships. The more you can have a light client mood in the classroom, maybe you can poke a little fun at yourself, which he did. Uh, the more it, uh, it, it helps us establish a. Uh, a sense of positive affective tone in the sense that uh, we can have fun in this class and I'm a person that likes to have fun. So a lot of things going on in this little clip, but the one I wanted to emphasize, emphasize is, you know, understanding students' interests and background and building that into the lesson. The teacher clearly did that. Okay, so, you know, that's one way to That as well, so that you can see, you the lights for me, so that you can see that um, 
this, you know, eye observation has an entire professional development suite that goes along with it. So if you want to know what it is we're looking for, you know, you can you can go to all of these resources and you know double check, look at the video, you know, check yourself. How am I how am I doing on this particular um, element? about a few anecdotal things that are kind of related to what we're talking about and not. So the first thing, uh, personality and some factors that influence them, regardless of what age the kids are that we deal with, one of the things that's really important um, for us to realize about students' personalities, you know, our own personality, you know, we need to know ourselves well and we need to know our students well. Think about birth order. How many of you are the oldest children in the family? I could have predicted that. <laughs> um, how many of you, there's a fun, there's fun activities to go along with this, but we don't have time for it. How many of you are in the middle? I could have predicted Jen was a middle kid. Right. And I never got anything I wanted either. <laughs> <laughs> That's because the babies of the family were too busy getting everything, everything that they, they wanted. Want. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, you know, just knowing where kids fall into uh, that family uh, birth order <coughs> comes into effect in their personalities and how they act and react with other kids in the classroom. Um, as well. Just think about the concept of dethronement. You know, ima just imagine this. You're, you know, women. You know, we'll leave you guys out for a second, but try to reverse this in your minds. Okay, imagine your husband comes home and um, he was like, you know, oh, you know, you're just so perfect and loving and blah, 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 blah. Love you, love you, love you. No. <laughs>
to John Myers Briggs typology, all people can be classified using the, this criteria. And it's not like either or. You're on a scale, you know, from one to one to the other. Um, but personal personality type matters, and, here, and here's why. Here's some research. Teachers are more likely to discipline students who do not share their personality type preferences. And I, I think back to being in the classroom myself, and I think that's absolutely true for me. We're more likely to discipline students who do not share our personality type preference. So students with certain personality type, like um, SP, sensing, perceiving, preferences drop out of school at much higher rate than students with other preferences. So you can you can really look and make some make some predictions there. Uh, personality type matters. The style difference uh, versus learning and behavior problems. Uh, think about um, you know writing whatever hand you use to write with. You know how normal it is to write with your regular hand, but how awkward it is to write with your other hand. So in your building your classroom community, when you are an extrovert, so to speak and you are you have created your entire structure of your classroom around what a typical extrovert student is going to want then there's this awkwardness about it's kind of like it was Heather Pyle today trying to use a smart board and she hadn't used it before and she felt totally stupid well it's not that she should feel totally it's kind of like using that cell phone for the first time so when we're pulling people out of their introvert, extrovert, or their sense and feeling, you know, out of what they're, they are, it, there's an awkwardness about it. It's not that we can't adapt as humans, but there's an awkwardness about it and being respectful of that. Personality type matters um, because we have personality preferences in how we gain energy how we take in information, how we make decisions, and how we approach life. So I'll show you, show you these um, in a little more detail. Teachers and personality type. Okay, take a look at your type. <coughs> the least common teacher types are ENTP, INTP, INTJ, INFP. Most of you are probably over on this side. I would guess. So those are the most common versus least common types of teachers. Very unique. Let me explain what this is. With the introvert, with the introvert, extrovert, I think what people typically associate with introvert and extrovert is are you real social, then you're an extrovert. Or are you quiet and shy, you're an introvert. That's not really what it means. What this refers to is how do you gain your energy. I am probably as strong an introvert as you can get to the point where I literally have to be by myself. I used to lie and say that I get re-energized by, you know, McKinsey, my family, being with me. It really isn't. I mean, I really do have to be completely by myself to get re-energized and rested, you know, for the next <coughs> day, for the next, you know, event. When I go to a social event or, um, you know, probably even like, you know, being around everybody today and, and um, facilitating this workshop, you know, I will, it, it will drain me, you know, and that's what an introvert does, you know, the social, sociality, is that a word, sociality, no, okay. the social milieu, is that a word, that, that drains introverts, and they, it's not that we can't do it, it's, you know, and as opposed to extroverts, they, they may or may not have a sense of being very social. You know, they could be real social, maybe not real social, but they gain their energy by going to the bar and being you know, social, being around lots of other people. That's how they get re-energized. So, that is just something. What did you say, Judy? I said, this explains a whole lot about my husband. <laughs> yeah. 
by ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Careful about what you're putting on YouTube. <laughs>
And it's just oh, what my <laughs> personality tells us. It's a lady for So um, I would just ask that um, if we could spend just a couple of minutes. Um, does anybody have something unique that they do in their classroom that is relevant to uh, building student interest and background that they would like to share or a way that you build community in your classroom that could be helpful to others? Uh, I, one thing that I tried this year, I came across this book um, during the summer in the library called Everything I Need to Know I Learned from a Children's Book and it had famous folks like Tiki Barber talking to football player talking about how he really internalized the little engine that could. And so I did a project on Schoology, just a quick post that the kids did, where they talked about a book that meant something to them. Um, and so that was one where I could go back to sharing how being an introvert, I learned through Matilda that I could be quiet and powerful. And so all the kids did that, and then they could talk to each other by posting them. Awesome. So they kind of liked that one. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. Jenna, can you think of any insights we had with our um, training with Kathy that I might not have brought to light? Mm. I think you hit everything. I'm so again, yeah, and, and, and I feel like you're thinking, I cannot believe I just spent an hour of my life listening to something that I already knew. But here's what I think. I think that we spend so much time doing hard stuff in teaching and learning that it's easy for us to forget to dribble the basketball. And all of Dr. Marzano's work is getting us to drill back to the basics and focus and master the basics of teaching and learning. And that's why I feel like these things are important. Certainly, you know, you know relationships in that piece with students is, is you know, one of my big things. But, but that's what all of this is about, is getting back to the basics. And, you know, I, Lisa had sent me an email, you know, asking a critical question about, you know, goals and scales and so forth. And it's like, you guys want so badly to do everything so perfectly that I'm afraid that you're worrying about split, you know, splitting hairs and you're trying to make everything so technically correct. This is going back to the basics and practicing consciously, deliberate practice in just simply dribbling the basketball. I mean, wouldn't you agree? I mean, there's nothing I said to you today that you didn't already know. So that's where our focus is, is doing the basics and doing them masterfully. And on this particular concept, I'm sure most of you are doing, doing great. But I hope you picked up a little something or an insight, at least the personality. The personality thing and how your personality and the other personalities in your classroom merge, um, you know, it may or may not affect you directly in terms of, you know, eye observation, but it's a fun thing to do. So 